Hey, uh, we're doing a series right now, and I'm going to jump right into it, um, entitled The Third Person, and it's about the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and I think it's interesting when, when you're the one up here and you're uh, uh, looking out there, it's interesting all of what you see while you're preaching, just even in the eyes of people, the way they're looking, the way they're acting while you preach. And you sort of can also pick up a, um, a vibe, if you would. I'll just use that word. Um, there are times you can just feel like there is total resistance to what you're saying while you're up here preaching. And I, I've noticed some of that during this series um, on the third person. And uh, it's funny because I, yesterday I was going for a walk. We have a bunch of acreage behind our house. It's not ours, but I go back and walk on these trails that are back there. And I was walking uh, yesterday, actually, in the morning. And uh, I'm back there walking, and I came right up to this varmint. It's right in the middle of where I'm walking. I mean, it's just right there. And it was like a, a what, what was it? A possum. And um, so, you know, this possum's just staring at me. You know, like usually if they see you, they just run. This one just sat there and did not move. Normally, I take a few things with me on my walk in case there's anything that I do run into while I'm walking. And I didn't have anything. I was eating a peach. That was my weapon. So I took a bite out of the peach and took a piece and I threw it at it. And I thought, surely he'll run or he'll eat it. I'll distract him. He just stared at me. He didn't even move. I'm like, I just gave you some peach, man. I mean, I'm actually talking to it while it's, it's, it's there. I'm, I'm, did not move, did not flinch. So I thought, well, I'll make you move. So I was like, ah, and I mean, I just did that. Just stared at me. It never moved. I'm like, dude, you are the craziest possum I've ever met. So the, so. Well, when I walked away from it, because I was going to go right by it, because that's where I was going, then I thought, he could bite me on the way through. He could have rabies, whatever. So I, I didn't have something to handle all of that with me, because um, he wouldn't have been alive today. He'd be having a funeral service. But anyway, um, so I, I walked the other way. I was like, you win. You know, I thought, I, I don't, I don't want to mess with this possum. But the way he stared reminded me of how, when I'm preaching on something like the Holy Spirit, that there are some people that just stare at you and they look at you like you're bizarre, like you're crazy, like they don't want to hear what you have to say. And what, what I've told you about this uh, in this series before we jump in today is be, depending on the background you came from, if you came from a specific background that preaches on the Holy Spirit, but more on the side of we believe he's not alive today, doing anything today, um, in fact, I've heard this before, and I'm going to just say it because I know some of you came to this church today with this kind of thinking in your mind. There's a scripture in the Bible in 1 Corinthians that says, in, it's chapter 13, it says, when the perfect one comes, tongues will cease, knowledge will cease, all these things will cease. And literally, people have said, that's the Bible. And when the Bible came, it all ceased. Listen, it's not the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. This is not part of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus and the Word are one, but this Bible you hold in your hand, it might be perfect in and of itself, but it's not the perfect one that it was talking about. When the perfect one comes, knowledge will cease. Well, then none of you know anything, and none of us can know anything, because the perfect one came, the Bible, and knowledge has ceased. No, Jesus is the perfect one. Are y'all out there? He hasn't come back yet for the church. So until he does, all the things that are in the Bible are still relevant and still for today. So this, this weekend, I'm teaching on something that I am sure that you're going to be like that possum. So I use that story for a reason, because I think some of you are going to be like, just staring at me the whole day and not moving, and you're not going to give. It's like, I'm not giving. My religion is more important than what the Bible says. My tradition that I grew up with is more important than what you're going to tell me that's in the Bible. My denomination that I'm in or out of, it's more important than anything that Bible you hold says. And I'm telling you, would you please consider taking off your spiritual glasses that you have on today and just listening to what the Bible says? You might be here and be like, oh man, what are you going to teach on? I'm going to teach on today what I entitled simply, if you have a card there, you'll see it on the front to take notes on, it's filled. We're going to talk about what the Bible says about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you came from a denominational background that taught you that this, that the day that you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit moves in, and he does. He lives on the inside of all of us who are believers, but that's not being filled. 
There's something separate from that in the Bible. And here's the question you have to ask yourself. Maybe I'll give you a couple questions to ask yourself. First of all, is it for everyone? And is it for today? And has it passed away? And if God thought it was so needful, why is there so much in Scripture about it? And it almost looks like God connects it to salvation. I won't say that. Not almost. God connects it all the time with salvation. That if you're saved, you need a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled. Now, I might just reference several times today. Don't give me the possum look, all right? Because some of you are already doing it. It's like. So, I want you to go with me in your Bibles to Acts, if you have a Bible. And we're going we're gonna to go to Acts chapter, um, well, before we do that, let me go to Luke chapter 24, and then we'll go to Acts. Luke chapter 24. So, so far, we've talked about who the Holy Spirit is. We talked about trying to demystify the idea that the Holy Spirit is so scary. He's not. He's only scary when people are scary. And then they make it all look like it's a scary thing. There are times when I'm up here preaching, guys, that on the dime, on the second, I, I know how this works. I played football, you know, uh, a lot of my younger life and played running back. And on a dime, you could stop and spin. I can't do that now. Changes when you get older. But on a dime, you could just stop. Well, on a dime, there are times that I'm switching up and you don't even know it. The Holy Spirit's taking me down a path because it's something you need to know. So I don't make a big deal about it. I don't do that. Thus saith the Lord right now. I don't, I don't have to. I just follow what he ha has to say. You don't have to make a big deal about the Holy Spirit. You just follow him and he'll lead you to the best path that you could ever be on. So we want to demystify him. We talked about for week number one, we talked about who is the Holy Spirit. Week number two, we said he is the power source. We brought a sweeper up on the platform, literally ran it for a while. And then we talked about how sometimes the plug gets pulled out, but people keep on acting like, I'm going to just keep on doing this. Well, if the sweeper is not connected to the power source, it stops picking up the dirt. And some of you have disconnected from the power source in your life, and you need to get reconnected. We talked about that in week number two. And then in week number three, which, which was last weekend, we talked about the Holy Spirit still speaks today. Not just through the Bible, but he still speaks to the heart of people. He's that still small voice on the inside that tells you yes or no. If you were not here, we encourage you to go back and listen to it. So this week, we're going to talk about Phil. Look at this, Luke 24. Jesus said this in verse 49 on the screen. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Notice it doesn't say this, in you. Jesus said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit upon you. In you happens at the new birth. Jesus said, there'll be a well of water living in you about the Holy Spirit, and there'll be rivers that flow out of you. The well in you is the Holy Spirit within. The well coming out of you is the Holy Spirit upon, or being filled with the Holy Spirit is what we've labeled it as. We'll give some other definition to it. But notice what he says. He says, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And I, I, I think we talked about the word power, but I want to tell you what this word endued means. We don't talk like this today. I use King James on purpose today. Endued with power. What does that mean? Well, it means to be clothed with. All of you got your clothes on today. I'm so thankful. Right? He says to be clothed. It means to be armed, to be furnished with what is necessary. Guys, the Holy Spirit arms us. And if you live in this world for any length of time, and especially in the age we're living in right now, you need the Holy Spirit. Guys, this is the craziest it's ever been. This is, this is bizarre, bizarre land. I mean, it is crazy. You can turn the TV on, read your newspaper, whatever it is you do, look at your phone for news. It's bizarre. It's the craziest time. Jesus said, when you see all that stuff happening that we're seeing right now, I'm coming back soon. That's what Jesus said. But before he comes back, he's not coming for a weak church. He's not coming for a defeated church. He's coming for a victorious church, not a defeated church. So he says, I'm going to clothe you, furnish you. Well, here's something interesting. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, if you came, and I'm thinking of one specific denomination, but I'm not going to mention the name. But if you came from it, you know exactly what I'm about to say. When you hear this, you'll be like, yeah, I remember that literally have been taught this from their denominations, people. That if you ask for the Holy Spirit, you're going to get something evil. You're going to get a devil if you ask for the Holy Spirit. They literally teach it. And they teach it that way to scare you, 
to never ask for the Holy Spirit. And they're like, if you do, you're going to get an evil thing, something evil. You're going to get filled with a devil. And it's like, listen, if you go to God with a sincere heart and say, God, I would like to have the Holy Spirit in my life manifesting the way the scripture says, do you think he's going to give you a devil? You think he's up there thinking, ha, ah, now I'm going to get you. God's not in it. God's not in the business of giving anything evil. Read the scripture, James chapter one and chapter two, chapter three, all through James. He says, God doesn't give you anything evil. Only good comes from the father. So for some of you, this is going to be a renewed idea today that you already know it, but it's going to be refreshing to say, okay, I need to get back to this. For some of you, it's going to be brand new. For some of you, you're not even a Christ follower. You're looking in from the outside and you might be thinking, huh, this is interesting. So just stay interested. Listen to what we're going to say. I believe you'll see how good God is as we go through this. So watch, I think Jesus knew the hour that we're living in, people would say this, that if you ask for the Holy Spirit, something bad could happen, something evil. I think Jesus knew. I think he's sort of pretty cool like that, that he knew all the way back then and said something about it and made sure for today, you could never really say this. Watch what it says, Luke 11, verse 11. It says this, verse 11 through 13. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Stop. Everyone look up. If you're normal, <laughs> your kid would never ask you for something, and you'd give them something evil. Now, my, my, my son Michael and his wife Amber, sitting up here on the front row today, they have a son. His name, is, one of their kids, his name is Paxton. And in the morning, almost every morning, I hear these little feet just running right out of his bedroom, right to me. I'm in the kitchen or to my wife. One of us are up early. And he asks for something. He's always asking. He calls it a little rolling ball. It's, it's literally, you get them at um, Earth Fair. They're almond-covered dates that you, you can buy, these date rolls, they call them. And he asks for one of those. And he asks for a cup of blueberries. And he asked for something to drink. Now, can you imagine me going out into the garage and saying, I'll be right back, go out the back door, come back in with a snake and say, you know, grandpa, he calls me papa. Papa loves you so much that I wanted to give you a snake instead of what you're asking for. Come on. Some of you got the possum look. No, no listen, this is, this is not the way God is. You don't ask something of God and God say, I know better for you. I'm going to give you a snake instead of something good. God is a good God. Notice what this says, verse 12. If he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? We know the answers are no, if you're normal. Because if you're abnormal and you were raised in a family that is abnormal, you might do evil stuff to your kids. Let me just tell you this. That's not normal. I grew up in a very strict family. My dad was very strict, military background, very strict guy, but he never did anything evil. He never came in one day and said, I got a scorpion for you. Instead of an egg, why don't you have this? Never did that ever. Jesus is using extremes because God is not like this. Now check this out, verse 13. If you then who are evil, the better translation is if you then who are natural, not evil, natural. Know how to give good gifts to your children. We all do. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I think Jesus knew there'd be a whole denomination of people and more than one that say, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, something evil could happen. No, that's not true. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, he said, you're not going to get an egg and, then, and get a scorpion instead. You're not going to ask for a fish and get a serpent instead. He said, no, no, you ask for the Holy Spirit, you're going to get the Holy Spirit. Now, I know you might be here and say, well, I already have the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm a Christian, Christ follower. I, I received the Holy Spirit. Well, so did all of these guys in the book of Acts. They had already asked Jesus into their heart, and they were already saved. But look what happens. Acts chapter 1, if you're following along, verse 4, 5, and verse 8. Watch this. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So you know the word baptized is interesting, right? Churches have decided baptism means to sprinkle. We sprinkled some water on you. That's not what it actually is. 
The word baptized is transliterated word for those that don't know. That means they took the Greek word because the New Testament's written in Greek and they transliterated it. They just brought it over to the English language. The Greek word is baptismo. They just brought it over and said baptized. So he said, you're going to be baptized. You know what the word baptized means? That's not the definition. The word baptized means to be fully submerged or immersed in or under. But one translator says it this way, when immersed in, when immersed under, that brings total change to whatever's being immersed, to whatever's happening, right? So in this case, when the Holy Spirit fills you or you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, he's going to change you. But watch what Jesus said, and and this is in verse 8. Luke's writing this, right? In verse verse 8, he says this, but you shall receive power. Everyone say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, not in you. He comes in you the day you ask Christ in your heart. He said, when he comes upon you and you shall be a witness for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. Notice he says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And when he does, he's going to bring power. Guys, if you're here today and you feel powerless, there's another step in your walk that you haven't taken yet. And that is having this further relationship with the Holy Spirit, where we've called it filled, we've called it baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls it baptism, baptized in the Holy Spirit. But he says this, he says, he'll come upon you. I like this word. In the original language, it means to arrive and to influence. So here's what he's saying. The Holy Spirit in this tent, this setting, he's going to arrive and then he's going to influence you. And I can tell you this in my life personally. Many of you have been in our church for years. Some of you are new. But I've been doing this now uh, 28 and a half years in this church. And I know this. The Holy Spirit arrived in my life back in 1979. And he's influenced my life the rest of my life. But not because I let him live there dormant. The Holy Spirit can live in your life dormant if you allow him. Because he's a gentleman. He's not going to make you. He's not going to force you. So, so all of you that are here today and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, has the Holy Spirit ever made you do something? Forced you. He just forced you. No, he's not a forceful person. The devil's forceful. Holy Spirit's a gentleman. Have you ever been in Giant Eagle and the Holy Spirit forced you to go grab the mic that everyone talks in and you can hear him over the mic and he, he forced you to go grab it and forced you to start speaking in tongues? You're like, yeah, that's, that's what happens to me. When the Holy Spirit comes on, he forces me. No, he doesn't. He's never going to force you. He gently will tug you. He gently will deal with your heart. He gently will speak on the inside of you. That's what he does. The enemy is forceful. God and Jesus are not forceful. They're going to be gentle with you. Now listen to this. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what happens. So it all boils down to this. Listen to what it says. Y'all with me? Y'all got that possum look going on. Listen, Acts chapter two, verse one says this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Let's stop for a moment. What's the day of Pentecost? Remember what we talked about? There were three major festivals or holidays, if you would, in the, uh, the children of Israel's life. Back in that day with the Jews, there were three major, seven total, uh, but three major. One of them was Passover, right? And Passover was when God passed over all of them, because they put that blood on their doorposts. If you read the Old Testament, you remember, they celebrated that. 50 days later was the day of Pentecost. And 50 is what Pentecost means. Without going into all the definitions, 50th is what Pentecost literally means. That's not a scary word, right? I mean, some people think Pentecost or Pentecostal is scary. It's the word 50. He says, when it came, they were all with one accord and one place. This is 120 of them. Now, I think this is interesting. I'm going to just throw it out for you to think about this, and you can go study it if you'd like. Think about this. In Genesis chapter 11, there's the Tower of Babel. And if you haven't read it, a bunch of them decided, all of them, we're going to make a tower that reaches the heaven to reach God. And the Bible says God came down, and he went ahead and scattered them and their language. Scattered all of them. Now, they were together at the Tower of Babel in pride. We're going to do something. In the upper room, they're there assembled in humility. Are you all with me? Now, watch this. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
Then there appeared undivided tongues as of fire. That doesn't mean it was, it was as. And it says it, it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues or languages is a better translation. Tongues means language. As the Spirit gave them utterance. So check this out. Back there in the Old Testament, Tower of Babel, God scattered their languages and no one could understand what anyone was talking about after they tried to build that. This is redemption. This is how God came and said, you know what? If you read later in this chapter, it says all of them could hear their language. The people, all these men and women came together. They were assembled together. And all of a sudden they're out in the streets and they could hear their language being spoken when they heard someone speak. God redeemed what he did back in the Old Testament. Back in the Old Testament, because they were in pride, because they were assembled together for the wrong attitude, because they were doing the wrong thing, he decided, I'm going to redeem that in the New Testament. I'm going to let people have this language redeemed where they can now have a language of their own where they talk directly to God. The devil can't understand it. People can't understand it. You're talking directly to God. God decided, I'm going to redeem what took place there, and I'm going to bring a, a redemption to it in the New Testament with people being filled with the Holy Spirit. So here, here it says they were all filled, and they began to speak with other tongues. Now, that scares people. Now, I've had people tell me before, I tried it for a minute, you know, and it was like, I, I, I sounded like gibberish. Well, listen, it's sure not going to sound normal. This isn't a language you understand and practice. Are y'all out there? It's not, well, I've been practicing this and I, I, listen, my family that, you know, I grew up in a family of Italians, right? My mom and dad both, uh, uh, spoke the language. My mom was born there, came over when she was 12 years old. So they spoke the language in the house. I didn't understand what they were saying. It was gibberish to me, but I did pick up on a few things. <laughs> Unfortunately, the words you shouldn't say, so I'm not going to mention any of them now, but I did pick up on some of them. There were times I'd go to my grandmother's house, my, my mom's mom, and she would start talking to me in the middle of a sentence in Italian. Somehow, some way, back then, we would figure out what she was saying. But it was gibberish. It was like, what, what are you saying, lady? So people think if I speak in other tongues, it's the same way. I don't understand what I'm saying, so why would I do that? This isn't for you. As much as it is that you have a direct prayer line now to God, that is not a selfish prayer line because most of the time when we're praying, we're praying for ourselves, praying for our kids, we're praying for the, whatever. When we pray in tongues like this is talking about, according to the Apostle Paul and writings that he wrote in the New Testament, we're now praying directly to God and we're praying out, listen, we're praying out our future. We're praying out things about our children. We're praying out things about our lives down the road. And if you're here and you're like, man, this is crazy. This is in the Bible. Listen, I can feel the tension right now in the room. I don't know if you know I can feel things. And I want you to just hear this real quickly. I didn't write this. I didn't write it. So if you're here and you're like, ah, listen, the Apostle Paul didn't write this. He wasn't even saved yet. But he wrote so much about this later in his books. Luke is writing this and... He's writing it under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's not writing it just as a history book. If God didn't want this stuff to be talked about, and it's like, please don't talk about this in church, he would have never put it in his word. Are you all out there? So if you're here and you're like, I've never heard anything about it, in a moment, let me show you a scripture about that and see what, see what happened when they said this. But in verse 4, he says they all began, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They all began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And here's what's interesting. I, I like studying the Greek language, right? So in verse 4, it's in a tense called the ingressive aorist tense. Now, it might not mean anything to you, but here's what it means. It means it's a description of an event that is a one-time event that leads to an ongoing experience. In other words, this is not supposed to stop. The one-time event is the wind they heard and the tongues of fire that looked like it was on their head. That's the one-time event. It doesn't happen like that now. It's not like you're sitting in church like, oh my gosh, it happened. We had a wind, and then all these tongues of fire came and said, that's not how it happens. That was the one-time event. It was the entrance of the Holy Spirit in this manifestation on the earth for the very first time this way. But it's for an ongoing experience, not a one-time experience. So I want, you, I want you to read along with me. These will be up on the screen. Check this out. Acts chapter 2. Verse 32 and 33. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. 
Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise, remember that, of the Holy Spirit, he poured out that which you now see in here. Look at this, verse 38, just for time's sake. Then Peter said to them, Peter starts preaching, repent, that word means turn from, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. For the promise, remember the promise, we just read about that in Acts chapter 1, when they received the promise, they all were filled and began to speak with other tongues. Watch this. For the promise is for you, your children, and all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. You know that, that many that are afar off? That's you and me. I'll say it again. The many that are afar off, that's you and I. For now. This has not been done away with. Now, I know people have said, no, no, it's been done away when the last apostle died. Where is that in Scripture? That's irritating. That's not even in Scripture. Well, when the last apostle died, everything stopped. No, it didn't. You want to know why? There, there is one apostle, and it's in Hebrews, you can find it. One apostle who never died. His name is Jesus. He is the apostle the Bible says, of our faith. He has not died. He is still alive. And everything that he preached, everything that he said, and everything his word says is still alive. So let's check this out. We're almost done. In Acts chapter 19, if you want to go there, you can. This is 25 years later after Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. 25 years. This is the apostle Paul. He's not one of the 12. So this is some guy that he comes along afterwards, 25 years later, he's preaching in these towns. Listen to what happens. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, and Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, finding some disciples. So we don't even know who they are. Just some people that they decided to receive Christ, following Christ. Watch this. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Question mark. Did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? Everyone look up here. I'm not trying to distract you. I thought you did receive the Holy Spirit when you did believe. That's what happens. He comes and lives on the inside of you. See, Paul's saying this. There's a separate experience from the Holy Spirit when he comes and lives on the inside of you from the Holy Spirit when he comes upon you and fills you. Can I, can I give you an example real quick? Many of you probably have heard this before, but Jesus made this statement in, in the Gospels. He said, you cannot take old wine or new wine, and put it into old wineskins. How many are familiar? You've heard that. If you've been in church, you've heard it. You can't take new wine and put it into old wineskins. Well, in that day, they would have wineskins that they would use and reuse for wine. So when they made wine, they didn't have uh, glass things like we have today. They had these, these wineskins. Well, after one use, they would leave them ha dry, hang out and dry, and they would become hard. And if you put the wine in them, they would explode. The new wine would explode this hard dill. So you know what they would do? They would rub oil on them. Now listen closely. Oil is a representation of the Holy Spirit when he comes and lives in you at the new birth. Wine, which is poured in, is a representation of the Holy Spirit filling you when you get filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit like the scripture talks about. You are looking like possums. You think the Bible was written just with a bunch of stories that don't even relate to each other and they don't make any sense? This Bible is incredible. Every story in it has background and story and more things that we don't even know yet that come out every time we preach on it. Now watch this. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? I love when I meet people like this. They accepted Christ, but they don't know a thing about the Holy Spirit. You know what you don't have to do? Get rid of all the religion. There's like, man, there's a Holy Spirit. Awesome. But you get a bunch of religious people, what happens with them? Well, my pastor said back in 1964. My pastor said back, back years ago or whatever. No, 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 watch this. So they said it, and we've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. I love that. And they said, to, uh, he said to them, into what were you baptized? Now he's talking about going back to this baptism of, you know, whether in water. He says, they said, we were baptized in John's baptism. And then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to people they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. They heard this. They were all baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then watch this, verse 6, so strange. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, I know, I know for some of you, you're like, really? 
This is crazy. Listen, I've seen it all. I've seen people make fun of it. When we first accepted Christ in our life, my wife and I, my, my, my older brothers, my two younger brothers had not yet gotten into it and they weren't really into what we were doing, you know? And uh, my younger brother, Pat, was like a comedian in the house. He could do Rodney Dangerfield. Everybody that you ever have seen that was funny, he could do them all. I get no respect. You know, he would do all this stuff and all of us would just laugh. And well, we accepted Christ. Our lives went down this different path. And he found out about this whole deal about being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with tongues. So we told him we had had this happen in our lives. So he would go around our house while we would be there. He'd say it to us. He'd go, prayer tongue, prayer tongue, prayer tongue, prayer tongue. He would just go around making that sound, prayer tongue, and make fun of us the whole time. And we would just be like, you're so bizarre. So we've been made fun of. There are people that have made fun of me even in our town that are preachers. That are, Oh, you know, you're, you go to that crazy church. They're into that Holy Spirit. Well, wait a minute. What are you into? You're not into the Holy Spirit? Like, what are you into? Because the Holy Spirit is who you need to empower you in this life that you live in. So we can make fun of it. We can think it's like a joke. We can think it's stupid. We can think all the things we want. But you need a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You need to take the next step to say, I need this in my life. There's something that's been absent, and I need this in my life. Let me show you a couple more things, and we'll be done. Is this good? All right. How many? Give me a couple more minutes. All right. Awesome. So that's about 30 right there, all those hands. Thank you. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, really, real quick. This is eight years after Acts chapter 2. So in other words, why I'm saying that, one's 20-some years, one's eight years. In other words, it's still going on. And people have said, well, you know, when the Bible came, and all of us sent away with, no, no, that's not true. The Bible was canonized in the three, year 300, and people argue 330-some, 390-some. But when it was canonized, it wasn't the Father, Son, and Bible. The Bible is canonized, in other words, put into all the books that we have, made legit, fine, but the Holy Spirit wasn't done away with on that day. So check this out. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Man, my prayer today is the Holy Spirit would just fall on people today and just say, you know what? He's here. He wants to fall just like he did back in the book of Acts. Watch this. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished so this is crazy. These are Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit, and up to this point, only Jews did. Watch what it says. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the Gentiles also. How do you know when the Holy Spirit's been poured out? Check it out. For, as, uh, for they, verse 46, heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water? that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. You know what that means? Just like we did at Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2 where we were reading. He said, can't Gentiles now? If they can receive the Holy Spirit, they should be able to be baptized. Because I don't know if you get this or not. The Jews thought, we don't want anything to do with Gentiles. And I love this about God. Because you know how we have the racial conflict that we have in our country right now? And in the world right now, there's race, whether you know it or not, if you want to have your just head buried into the sand, I don't know, there's anything going on. There's something going on right now. I didn't know that there was. There's the worst racial conflict that there's ever been. America could actually have breakouts of things that they had back in the 60s and 70s if we don't do something about it as the church. If we, as the church, don't do what happened here. When the Holy Spirit came, you know what it did? It knocked down the walls of, well, we're Jews, you're Gentiles. And now the church needs to rise up and say, it doesn't matter if you're black. It doesn't matter if you're white. We are together in this. We're not fighting with each other. Come on. And the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's the only one that can do that. And, and this is funny because there are times that I'll preach like this, you know, what, where I'm doing this right now. And there's some people, they'll get the possum look right while you're, while you're preaching like this because they're like, something happened that I don't know about? Yeah. There's been killings. There's been shootings. There's been things that have been totally dishonorable. And if we just sit back and act like it's not going on or 
the church can come and say, we're going to unite under one name. His name is Jesus, and we're going to unite under that name no matter what we look like, no matter what background we come from, no matter what color we are, no matter what side of the track, no matter where we're from, we're going to unite under one name. Woo. Thank God I work out and I can actually preach like this and not, not lose my breath. Acts chapter 8. Just kidding. I'm going to close. Acts chapter 8. I know some of you are like not happy right now, but here's the deal. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he came to break down the wall of division. When Jesus came and resurrected from the dead, he broke down that wall. But the Holy Spirit comes and says, listen, I'm the only one that can unite the ununitable. I'm the only one that can come and unite people that are from such different diverse backgrounds, such different cultures. I'm the only one that can do it. The Holy Spirit will make you love when you don't want to love. The Holy Spirit will open your eyes when your eyes have been closed. He's the one that can do that. So check this out. We'll close. Because here's the last thing I want to talk to you about. I've been told by people all the time. I've been teaching on this for years, right? So I've been told this often. That there are people in the book of Acts that receive the Holy Spirit and they never prayed with tongues. So tell me about that, Pastor. Well, let me just tell you this. Every time that I read, they prayed in tongues after they received. So here's one of the examples they use. I'm not going to go to it today, but you can look at it later. Well, when Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't speak in other tongues. Someone came to me not long ago and challenged me in that one. They said, hey, Pastor, when Paul, you know, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, he never prayed in tongues. Tell me about that one. And they started to get sort of nasty about it, you know. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. I said, are you sure you want to challenge me you know, on this? Because are you sure he never prayed in tongues? Oh, yeah, it's not anywhere in the Bible. Paul never prayed in tongues. I'm like, oh, my gosh. You haven't read your Bible, have you? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul makes this statement, chapter 14. He said, I pray in tongues more than ye all. Paul was from Texas, Right? Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all. What is he talking about? He prayed in tongues. Who's he writing to? The craziest church on the planet. He was actually writing a letter to them to correct their stuff that they were doing. They were a little bit crazy with the Holy Spirit, and he had to correct them and say, listen, if unbelievers come into the room and you're doing your crazy stuff that you're doing, they're not going to understand what you're doing. So he's trying to bring some order to what you do when you're in a church service with people and the Holy Spirit, all that kind of stuff. So he's trying to get them on the right track. But in that same chapter, he says, but I do pray in tongues more than you all. He just said this. This is basically what he's saying. But I have a little bit more wisdom than all of you. So let me train you on the fact that you ought to have some wisdom when people that don't have the Holy Spirit don't know what you're talking about. That's what Paul was doing in 1 Corinthians. But the only other place is right here. Watch this and we'll close. Acts chapter 8 verse 14 says this. And when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. That means they were saved. They received the gospel. Verse 15 who when they had came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had yet not fallen. Remember when he fallen in that other verse that we said? Then it said they spoke with tongues. Well, watch, this one doesn't say that. He says he fallen on all of them, and they, he had not yet up to this point, and they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then he laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And so if you read this, you're like, oh, well, nothing happened. That's it. Because watch this. And when Simon, Simon the sorcerer, He's into sorcery. He saw this, and he said, man, if through a laying on hands by the apostles, the Spirit's given, he offered them money saying, give me this power. Then anyone who I lay my hands on can receive the Holy Spirit also. Well, there must have been something he saw. (laughs) You're going to pay money as a sorcerer to get this gift, to do the same thing they were doing, but they didn't speak in tongues? Watch this. Peter said to him, your money perished with you. Because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart's not right with God or in the sight of God. Now, if you read it like that, it's like, well, they didn't, Pastor. Pastor, you're wrong. They didn't pray, they didn't pray in tongues. I don't care what you say. Here's the problem. There's a word they used here, and they said, you have no part in this matter. Everyone say matter. The word matter is the Greek word. We get our English word speaking or utterance. And the way it should read is, you have no part nor lot in the speaking or utterance, which tells me they heard something 
they heard them speaking or they would have never used this word. So here's what's interesting about it. The reason why I say all of that is when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, guys, there's, there's something that happens. It's sort of like this one. If you fill your gas tank up and don't stop, it starts outpouring out, out of, right? When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, there's something that happens. You speak in another language. And I know it's crazy for some people. They're like, ah, that's just so crazy. Listen, here's the cool thing about our church. Back years ago in churches, you had to believe what they believed before you could belong. In our church, we want you to belong even if you don't believe. And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Even if you're here and you're like, I got some arguing to do with God about this. I'm cool with that. You can argue with God all you want. God, God's, he's the one you should go to and say, God, I don't understand this. Uh, give me more light on this. I don't, I don't, is pastor crazy? You should go to God and talk to him about it. And then he'll help you. I believe he will. So in closing this up, I want to, I want to just read one scripture because I, I think when you hear about the Holy Spirit like this, the bottom line that I would ask if I was sitting in the congregation, and I can't go over all of these right now, I would ask, what are the benefits What's the benefit of being filled with the Holy Spirit? I mean, what? So we can fight about who speaks in tongues and who doesn't? So the people who do speak in tongues feel like they're better than people who don't? That's what happens a lot of times. Our church is better than your church. We speak in tongues, you don't. No, that's not what this is for. Let me show you what it's for. One, one thing, not, well, not the only, and we'll close this up. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4 says this. For he who speaks in a tongue or an unknown tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, guys, listen, I know people have said, well, why would you want to speak to God like that? You don't even understand what you're saying. Because a lot of times when you speak in English, you're limited by your knowledge of what you have right here. But when you do this, you're speaking out things that only your spirit and the Holy Spirit knows about. And it's the perfect prayer. But check this out. This is actually what I wanted to tell you. Verse four, he who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself but he who prophesies edifies the church. So here's what he's saying. In, in public, he who prophesies will edify the church. One other translation says this. He who preaches will edify the church. He who speaks in an unknown tongue privately will edify himself. One is talking about private life. One is talking about public life. Now listen closely. He uses the word edify as we close this up. Edify is the word we get where we charge up a battery. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many here have ever felt like you need a charge? Right? I mean, all, all of us have felt that way before. I, I don't know if you you can be some, like half the place didn't even raise their hand. So you're like, I don't know. I'm burnt out all the time. No. This is the whole idea of why America is in the, in the condition it is and the world is, is because we refuse to get plugged into God's power. God, listen, God decided this is the way it is. As crazy as it sounds, as crazy as, your, as it seems to your mind that, oh, really, this is how God decided we're going to be connected to power? Yeah, God decided it. If God would have said, you know what, I'm going to do it this way and it's some other crazy way, then we would have done it. But this is the way God said. So I want you to hear something. If you're going to edify yourself, build yourself up, there'd be a reason why you needed to do that. And you want to know what the reason is? You live in a crazy world. And the crazy world you live in is constantly putting a drain on you, whether you realize it or not. The moment you watch TV, the moment you put on the news, the moment you listen to the kind of whatever you're listening to, it's draining you. That's what it's doing. Just living in this world, it's draining you. And you know what he's saying here? You can get connected to the Holy Spirit and get edified, build up, charged up, and everybody needs to be charged up. So I'm going to put a quote on the screen. It's from a pastor. He pastors in Alabama. Our church highly respects him. His name is Pastor Chris Hodges. And he said this, being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. I'm going to say it one more time. I want him to leave it on the screen. I'd like you to write it down. Take a picture of it if you have to. You take pictures of everything else like yourself. So you might want to just take, take that picture. Anyway, being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. Being filled with the Holy Spirit makes me better than me. Guys, listen. People, long, 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 I believe, has the day passed where Christians should stop, stop acting like I'm better than you. I'm better than you because I read my Bible more than you or I'm in church more than you or I pray in tongues and you don't. I'm better than you. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, guys, 
it doesn't make me better than anyone. What it does is the me without the Holy Spirit is not a good me. Me with the Holy Spirit has radically changed my life. You with the Holy Spirit, he will radically change your life. So I want to close. Listen, listen, listen. You are here today, and many of you right now are really challenged. You're like, this is so different. Many of you are like, awesome! I mean, you know, you're the kind of person that's like, you hear this and you're like, I'm jumping in all the way. I want everything you got. But here's the deal. I believe everybody needs to take the next step in their walk with Jesus. Paul said this in Acts chapter 19, where we read earlier. He said, I'm tying, he said, I'm going to tie this right in with salvation. Since you believed, have you received? And the question you have to ask yourself, since I believed, have I received the Holy Spirit like he's talking about here? And, and today, I want you to just consider this. Consider taking the next step. Nothing to be embarrassed about. If you're here and you're like, well, I don't, want to, I don't want anyone to know that I haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. It's okay. Listen, you still have him living in you. Everybody does that has accepted Christ. He lives in you. But he just wants you to go that one next step. Not so you could be better than someone else, but so you can be a better you. I believe God wants to have our church have a bunch of better people, better yous, if I could. He wants you to be better than what you are right now. So I want to ask you to close your eyes just for a moment. Father, we pray the Holy Spirit will just fall in this place. We pray the Holy Spirit today will touch lives of people, deal with hearts of people that need to go the next step, the next level. We have a passion at Faith Family Church to discover all that God has for us. We welcome and honor our guests so you can experience a church that is full of life and encounter a God that's real and loves you. Our worship experiences are designed for every age, helping you to live out a personal relationship with Jesus and develop an authentic faith in Him. We want to redefine church as you might know it, and we're reaching people around the world through our live stream. So we encourage you to join us live online every Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Because Faith Family Church is for families, for singles, for couples, for the elderly, for young people, for the hurting, the lost, the hopeless. Faith Family Church is for people.